Brothers and sisters in the Lord, how well do you sleep? Is it easy to fall asleep or is it a struggle for you? Are there times when your sleep is disturbed by your worries? Perhaps you've even had a dream at times that manages to express the worries in your life in a way that your conscious mind can't even. Well, this morning we see that Abram, he has these worries and he has troubled sleep. But God comes to him with words of comfort. In the face of his worries, God reminds Abraham of his promises. I bring you this morning's sermon under the following theme. The Lord God assures the faithful. Our first point, Abraham struggles. Our text begins with the words, after these things, as mentioned Before the reading, this refers to the rescue of Lot. Now, after these things, Abraham is back home in his own bed. It doesn't specify how much time has passed since the rescue of Lot. It's merely that it is after it. And in verse 1, we read, The word of the Lord came to Abraham. And this is an interesting phrase, because this is often how God speaks to the prophets. Though none of his children were born... God comes to Abraham, and he has a message for his people. Just as the prophets spoke to the Israelites and still speak to us, so the vision of Abraham is a message for all God's people. We read that when God speaks to Abraham, it's in a vision, and verse 5 tells us that it is at night, so it's likely that Abraham was dreaming. Now, this wasn't a, a hazy or an uncertain dream, but it was a coherent revelation of God. Verse 1, God says, fear not, Abraham. Abraham, while secure in his own bed again, God tells him not to fear. The warning not to fear is a very common expression when God gives revelation, either by his own voice or through an angel. Yet in this text, it doesn't seem to be a frightening encounter. God comes to Abraham and he addresses his anxieties. God reveals himself to Abraham to comfort him. In Abram's troubled sleep, when things are heavy on his heart, God comes near to him. Now this reminds us that God's revelation in his word is a comfort for us as well. And in verse 1, God makes a promise with two parts. He says, first, I am your shield. This is a promise of protection. And we know from chapter 14 that Abraham had already experienced this. Abram had faced this great army, and he had won a great victory. Certainly, God was keeping this promise of protection. And the second part of the promise in verse 1, your reward shall be very great. God's promise of blessing and prosperity had been kept. Since his call in chapter 12, Abram had only grown in riches. Abram was so comfortable in what God had provided for him that when he won that victory, he denied the spoils of war. What God said to him in this vision in verse 1, Abram already knew and already experienced. But what was truly the reward that Abram desired? What was on his heart that night? What more did God mean in this promise? In verses 1 and 2, we hear about Abram's deepest struggle. Verse 2, we read the word, but. In the midst of all of this blessing, he is in anguish. We shouldn't mistake this for a lack of faith in Abraham, but we should recognize this as the genuine struggle that we also have within our faith. To reinforce that Abraham is not complaining here or accusing God of anything, Abraham says, O Lord God. The language here uses the utmost reverence. The ESV puts the word God in all caps to express the nuance of the Hebrew. The NIV translates this as, O Sovereign Lord. Abraham knows who he's talking to. The Almighty God, the one whose promises are reliable. Abraham knows he can pour out his heart to the God who knows and controls all things. The God who is able to help in grief. Abraham asks in verse 2, What will you give me? For I continue childless. Abram is aware of all the ways God has been his shield and his reward, but he has not seen a child of his own yet. It's been many years since Abram and Sarah set out from Haran. When Abram left, he was 75. 
How many years had passed since they had left? How many years since the promise to be, ma to be made into a great nation? In the next chapter, we read that he was 86 when Ishmael was born. They could have been waiting for up to 10 years already. Abram, he tells God his key worry, the ongoing source of his grief. His desire for a son is met with ongoing disappointment. He feels he might not understand God's plan. In verse 2, he points at the way things seem to be going. He said, the way things seem to be going, I continue childless, and the heir of my house is Eliezer of Damascus. If Abram doesn't have a son, everything that God has blessed him with will go to one of his servants. And this was a practice of the time, that if there was no heir in the household, a servant would inherit everything. But this is a challenge because an heir is not just the one who inherits all your stuff, but an heir is a continuation of the father. His life and his identity continue in his son. A servant heir would not continue in the same way that a son would. At this point in verse 2, Abram might be asking, is this your plan, that my name would be made great, that would be continued through adoption? Maybe Abram is wondering, has God been explicit about how I will become a great nation? In verse 3, Abram, he repeats the same question in a different way, but it's the same concern. Abram tries to find another way to respectfully approach God. While feeling this pro profound sense of desperation, he is trying to express, I want a son. I believe your promises. I want your promises. Abram, he had faith. In the face of this great struggle, he expressed not just what he desired, but who he desired it from. God alone. His plans and his blessing are what we need. We cry out for his promises. We ask about his will and we desire it. Jesus Christ, he knew this in the truest way possible. Jesus knew God's plan to bless humanity through him. But in the Garden of Gethsemane, he prayed to his father in agony, knowing that his father's will would be done. Jesus asked if the cup of wrath would be removed from him. But he ends his prayer saying, nevertheless, not my will, but your will be done. How hard would that have been to say, knowing exactly the suffering that would follow? When Jesus prayed, he had faith. Now we struggle with this ourselves. In our faith, we have challenges and we have barriers that we wish we didn't have to struggle with. Some of us struggle in the same way as Abram and Sarah, the desire to have children. We see all around us God's care and his blessing in so many other ways. But oh, the longing to have a child, how else can that be satisfied? What else is like becoming a mother or a father? Now, that's not the only way Christians struggle. Some struggle with the desire to find a godly spouse. It seems so easy for others to find someone we might ask and we might say something, why is this so difficult? Now many others struggle with thoughts of the future, having restless nights, worried about our children, whether they're small or whether they're grown, we worry. We worry about our own direction in life and at every stage of life, there's, there are different worries that creep into our hearts. Life has challenges complex ones. There are things in our lives that hurt us. There are also good desires that remain unsatisfied. We are waiting for God at times, it feels. But we have faith. We know, like Abraham, that deep in troubles we can come to our sovereign Lord knowing who he is and that his promises are certain. His character is good, and he comes near to those who are worried and anxious. He cares about your worries. In 1 Peter 5, verses 1 through 7, we read, Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, so at the proper time he may exalt you. 
casting all your anxieties on him because he cares for you. Peter describes us as being under the mighty hand of God. God has control of everything. What you worry about is not something that has escaped his notice, but we read at the proper time he will exalt you. Our mighty God has made promises to you. He knows you. He knows your challenges. So bring them to him. Cast all your anxieties on him because he cares for you. What an incredible thing to know. And this is what Abram did when he was lying in his bed, dreaming anxious dreams. God comes to him, and God comforts him. This almighty and powerful God, who controls all of creation, is near and personal. So come to him with your prayers, knowing who he is. Tell him your worries. Tell him about what's heavy on your heart. Even if you can't express it to others, express it to him. He hears you, and he cares about you. And that leads us to the second point, God's assurance. In verse 4, we see again, Behold, the word of the Lord came to him. God speaks to Abram, who is struggling with his worries. We'll see in verse 4 how God addresses Abram's exceptions and his worries. And then in verse 5, how God illustrates the degree of his promises. Now, God is very direct in verse 4. God says, this man shall not be your heir. There's no adoption loophole for God's promises to take place. If the promises to Abraham to, be a great, to become a great nation weren't clear enough from Genesis 12, now it is very clear. The second half of verse 4, God says, your very own son shall be your heir. God is saying, I promised you a son, I am going to give you a son. And in the Hebrew, there's a bit of wordplay going on. Eliezer is referred to as the son of my house. And in verse 4, God says, the son of your body. It's explicit that Abram will physically father a child. Still, this would be hard to accept at, at his age. Abram and Sarah, they knew that their bodies were old. They knew what God had promised was counterintuitive to the biological reality. Still, God says, from your body there will be an heir. God is clear that a physical family will happen. There is a promised son. Abram will be a father. Despite being as good as dead, like we read, read about in Romans 4, he will be a father. We know that he was 99 when he finally had a son. And that was 25 years after he was called out of Ur of the Chaldeans. With the birth of Isaac his heir, and his life, his pro the promises made to him would continue. What God had promised to Abraham, he also promised his son Isaac. And this continued into the generations. Each one born into this family were heirs of God's promises. This promise of an heir, he, Abram, he longed for it. But it wasn't just Abram who was longing for, for a promised heir. The whole world was looking for the promised offspring. From Genesis already, they were looking for an offspring that would crush the head of the serpent. Through Abraham, the promised Messiah would come. The heir is not just a recipient of the promises, but the heir would be the one who fulfills them. Jesus Christ is the heir of righteousness. It is only Jesus who is the worthy heir of the promises of God. And Galatians 4 verse 5 tells us that by his redemption, we are adopted as sons and daughters of God. Through faith, all believers are the promised heirs of Abraham. Boys and girls, the promise of God is for you too. God has adopted you as his child. In Romans 4, the verses 9 through 12 illustrate this adoption in this way, that Abraham had faith before his circumcision, 
His faith preceded the signs of the covenant so that all who believe would also share in the promised righteousness that we receive by faith. And verse 12 tells us this was to make him the father of the circumcised who are not merely circumcised, but who also walk in the footsteps of faith that our father Abram had before he was circumcised. We walk in these same footsteps of faith as Abraham's heirs. We are the offspring that he has hoped for. The promise of a great nation built up around the one heir, Jesus Christ. What a beautiful fulfillment of these promises. Now in Genesis 15, verse 5, we read, And the Lord brought him outside and said, Look toward heaven. Number the stars if you're able to number them. We see how God illustrates the grandeur of his promises to Abraham. God takes Abram out of his bed full of anxious cares, and he tells him, look at his promises. Now, I can't help but think about Psalm 16, which we sang. Even at night, my heart shows me the way. The Lord is near, and he in safety guides me. In your sleepless nights, God is near, and he directs our heart our hearts upward. God tells Abram, look to the stars, count them. There's no way he could do this in just one night. But this shows the degree of God's promise. It's beyond measure. There are so many stars, but they're all in place at God's command. Now God tells him in verse 5, so shall your offspring be. Wow! In Deuteronomy 10, verse 22, we read a summary about Abram's descendants. Your fathers went down to Egypt, 70 persons. And now the Lord your God has made you as numerous as the stars of heaven. This multitude of descendants is seen as the fulfillment of what we read in verse 5. God kept his promise to Abraham. The census in the book of Numbers, those That great number of people is nothing compared to the number of stars. But we know the number of Abraham's descendants is not just according to the flesh. But believers count in this number too. In Galatians 3 verse 7, those of faith are sons and daughters of Abraham as well. Now I can't begin to count the number of believers that there has been. And I have no clue how many stars there are. But God knows each one by name. Not only does drawing our attention to the stars make us consider the multitude of Abraham's descendants, but it also reminds us how beautiful it is to be part of God's plan of salvation. What am I that God took me out of Ur of the Chaldeans, out of my lost and sinful life, and made me his son and heir? Who is this God who so freely offers me his promises? Why do I have a place in his plan? How can I do anything but believe? And how is it, how is it that all he wants from me is faith? It's almost unbelievable. And that brings us to our third point, faith that counts. Verse 6 says, And he believed the Lord, and he counted it to him as righteousness. Now that's an incredible summary statement. Paul quotes this multiple times in Romans 4. The whole section shows us Abram's continued faith in God. Verses 2 and 3, By faith, Abram, he expressed his deepest worries to God. And in verses 4 and 5, God comes near and he refreshes Abram's hope with his word. Abram's faith is in God, and it's particularly in his worries that he has this faith. Abram believed that God would give him a son. God would send a promised offspring to him and also to his descendants. Abram, he believed. Looking ahead, he believed in the promised Messiah. Abram's faith was forward-looking. 
And God counted this faith as righteousness. Now, what does it mean to be righteous? To have a right relationship with God. It's to give God what he deserves in this relationship. And that includes perfect obedience to his will. And we know that's not us. We know that even today we have done what is displeasing to God. We have sinned. And we know that there is only one righteous man, Jesus Christ. And he is the only one who who kept the laws perfectly and has given God what, what is deserved. But what Christ has done, he has done for us. And there is only one requirement, faith. Our faith counts as righteousness before God. In Romans 4, Paul tells us that it is not by works that we are counted, but the one who believes is justified by faith. Paul tells us what the content of our faith should be at the end of chapter 4 of Romans. It should be that God sent his promised son into this world and that the son was raised from the dead and he delivered us from our sins. This is what we need to believe. This is where we have our faith. Now we've talked about much about how faith can give us hope in, the, in a time of challenges and how we have comfort during the struggles of our lives because we have faith. But faith is more than a gift of emotional endurance. Faith, even a small faith like that of a child, count, counts as righteousness. How beautiful is that to hear that it's only our faith that counts. It's not our beautiful prayers or any of the sacrifices we make. It's not our personal obedience, our greater Bible reading, but it is faith that gives us Christ's righteousness as our very own. It is by faith that Christ's righteousness is made ours. And Paul tells us that the words, it was counted to him, were not written for Abraham's sake alone, but it was written for our benefit as well. Faith, that's all that counts. In hard times, that's all that we have. And in good times, it's the only thing that still matters. Whether our faith is hot or cold at the moment, we need it just as much. Faith, it's such a small word on paper, yet it means so much. How can such a little thing have such big consequences? We use this word so regularly, but it's so essential. How does so much fit into such a small word? How can something so simple mean so much to so many? And merely to have faith is to have Christ's righteousness. Faith, it's all that counts. Brothers and sisters, if you believe God, he will count it to you as righteousness. So brothers and sisters, in those troubled, sleepless nights, when your heart is heavy, pour out your worries to the sovereign Lord who hears you and cares for you. He will be near in the nighttime of your fear. Come to him with your prayers. Listen for him in his word. Take comfort from his promises and look up from your worries. Look in faith to him. He has kept all his promises. Not one has been forgotten. And remember how incredible faith is that so simply in a complex world and a confusing life, that's all that counts. And all we have to do is believe and God will count it to us as righteousness. What an incredible promise to live in. Amen.